Hey, this morning, I'm going to share with you in many ways what I feel like is a prophetic sermon for the region out of the book of Judges and in chapter six. Now, it may have been a long time since you was in a church where you heard a pastor preach out of the book of Judges, but I believe every word of scripture is inspired. I believe that it is profitable for correction, training, reproof, and development so that the workman can show himself worthy of his hire. And I believe that there are hidden secrets all throughout scripture that if you have eyes to see and ears to hear what the spirit is still saying to the church, come on, you can pull revelation out of any chapter, out of any book, because the God who spoke back then is still speaking today. Now watch, the book of Judges is written immediately following the death of Joshua and prior to Israel having its first king. And during this in-between time period, the nation was ruled by judges who functioned as both spiritual and legislative voices of authority for the governance of Israel. These judges included people like Samson, Deborah, and others who God would raise up during critical moments in the nation of Israel to call the people of God back into right relationship with Yahweh. And Judges 6 tells us the story of one of those judges, a man named Gideon. And I believe that this is a word, not just for our church, but for our region in due season. Judges 6, starting in verse 1, this is what the Bible says. Now the Israelites, watch, they did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Midianites, watch, for seven years. Is not this the pattern of humanity throughout all of recorded history? People fall into sin. As a result, they experience spiritual oppression in their life. People cry out for deliverance. God in his mercy provides rescue. As a result, there is peace and prosperity. But soon the next generation forgets about God and falls right back into sin. It strikes me that all throughout scripture, people are either being delivered out of trouble or into trouble based on their obedience or disobedience to God. Hear me, I don't have to get hit by a car to know it's a bad idea. I don't have to eat rat poison to understand that it's probably bad for my health. And I don't have to walk away from God to know that disobedience will only lead me to a place of self-induced bondage. See, yes, Jesus is the chain breaker. Yes, Jesus is the cycle interrupter. Yes, Jesus is the generational curse destroyer. But he also loves you enough to protect your capacity to make free will decisions even when those decisions will lead you back to a place of darkness and bondage. But here's the good news of the gospel. Because of the blood of Jesus, today you can break the cycle of sin and dysfunction that has led to oppression in your life. No, you don't have to live from problem to problem. You can live from glory to glory. You don't have to go through the binge and purge cycles of sin. You can live righteously. I refuse to subscribe to a defeated Christianity that just accepts spiritual dysfunction as a permanent diagnosis. You can be set free you can walk free, you and your family can live in freedom if you will simply honor the Lord your God. And how many times do the biblical authors implore their readers, do not forget the Lord your God. Isn't this the temptation of the human experience? Breakthrough begins to happen. Prosperity begins to happen. Advancement begins to happen. And people soon forget that the credit isn't to us. It's to him. I am convinced that we are coming into a revival moment in the church of Jesus Christ like we have never seen before. I refuse to take credit for it. I refuse to think that this is the result of human ingenuity. No, God is vindicating us with an outpouring, not because we deserve it, but because we are dead without one. And the God who establishes nations, borders, and kings has not yet given up on the nation of America. No, do not forget what God has rescued you from. Do not forget his hand of blessing that has been on your life. Do not forget the undeserved grace and mercy he has poured out on your life and allow the testimony of God. 
allow the testimony of who he has been and what he has done to be the very thing that anchors you to a life of faith-filled obedience. You got to understand this today. The Lord doesn't deliver Israel to the Midianites for the sake of punishment, but instead for the sake of repentance. That they might see the fruit of their disobedience and in doing so, cry out to a God who is more than self-inclined to bring them into a place of deliverance. Watch, God in his sovereignty will allow the imperfect in order to refine the bride that they will have a renewed love that runs brighter than ever before. No, I am not gonna waste the pain of the last two years. Instead, I am drawing near knowing that God isn't yet finished with his people. And in verse two, the Bible says this, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because the power of Midian was so oppressive that the Israelites prepared for themselves dens, caves, and strongholds, which were in the mountains. And whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and other Eastern peoples invaded the country. I want you to see this. The Midianites and the Amalekites would wait until Israel planted their crops and then they would come in and steal, kill and destroy. Understand this, seasons of great harvest are always met by seasons of great conflict. And as a people, we must learn the art of holding a sword in one hand and a sickle in the other, a sword for battle and a sickle for harvest. Oh, scripture says it like this, God has opened a door, but on the other side, wait many adversaries. When the enemy comes in like a flood, it is God who raises up a standard. Stand firm and hold your position and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. For this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid nor be discouraged because of this vast army for the battle is not yours, but God's. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. The enemy hates the harvest. Notice, he doesn't attack what isn't producing. Hear me. He won't attack a dead marriage. He won't attack a dead business. He won't attack a dead nation. He won't attack a dead church. Pursuit, let me prophesy this morning. We are coming into a season of harvest that is unprecedented in this region. It is time to steady yourself for the days that are ahead. I see families being restored. I see salvation coming to entire households. I see revival coming to a college campus and we must not give the enemy an inch. This is our moment in history to see the prayers of the saints catch up with the church of God in the Northwest. Now watch, the Israelites, they was hiding in dens and caves. All the while, the Midianites and the Amalekites was occupying their fields, their houses, and their land. See, this, my friend, is the demonic strategy of the enemy for your life. To get you to hide in the cave while he gets to occupy your land. You cannot negotiate with this enemy. You cannot debate with this enemy. You cannot make a peace deal with this enemy. Either you will destroy him or he will destroy you. Let me just be honest for a moment this morning. I have to daily fight the temptation to hide in the cave. For friend, the church of Jesus Christ was not created to hide, we were created to shine. There is a man who lived a sinless life, who hung on a sinner's cross, who God raised from the dead on the third day. And that man told me I could ask. He told me I could ask for nations. He told me I could ask for the lost. He told me I could ask for provision. He told me I could ask for wisdom. He told me I could ask for the Northwest. The man on the cross told me I could ask, so I'm gonna be foolish enough to ask for my inheritance. Give me the nation.
Now watch. In the ancient world, the name Amalekites translated to this phrase. Watch. The spirit that inhabits those who lack the fear of God. See, when you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, you are leaving room in your heart to be tormented by inferior spirits. Hear me, Pursuit. When you don't fear the person of God, you will fear the enemies of God, and in doing so, allow that demonic spirit to harass you into a place of disempowered living. No, fearing God is not about being afraid. It's about being in awe and wonder, knowing that the God of heaven is a man of war who fights on behalf of his people. When I fear God, it's impossible to fear man. When I fear God, it's impossible to fear death. When I fear God, it creates in me love, power, and a sound mind. So we say fear of God come and fear of the enemy leave now in Jesus' name. You will not fear the arrow that flies by day. You will not fear the pestilence that stalks by night. A thousand may fall at your left and 10,000 by your right, but it will not come near you. Listen, I'm gonna prophesy myself into faith this morning with or without you. I need him more today than I did yesterday. I will need him more tomorrow than I did today. We are striking the ground in the Northwest until the nation resonates with revival. Watch, the Amalekite strategy is to wear down, tire out, weaken, and pick off the people of God to keep them from the destiny of their promised land inheritance. See, in the wilderness, the Amalekites was known for attacking Israel from behind, picking off the tired and the weak and the defenseless. Watch what the Lord says to Moses in Exodus 17. I love this. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of the Amalekites from under heaven. So Moses built an altar and he called it, the Lord is my banner. Because his hands was lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites. Watch from generation to generation. Listen, we are in a multi-generational battle for the soul of the nation. And that's why you are facing the level of resistance you are. And every generation must redefeat the Amalekite spirit that seeks to wreak havoc on the people of God. The reason why we're fighting is because as long as the Lord tarries, there will be another generation at some point or time that fills the chairs of this church. And I wanna give them the best head start possible because any battle that I run from doesn't disappear. It just gets handed down with interest to the next generation. If I don't fight the Amalekite spirit in my generation, my kids have to fight it in their generation. And the Lord speaks to Moses and he says, make sure Joshua hears this. Yes, I am the Lord, your banner. Yes, I will give you victory, but I will fight the Amalekites from generation to generation. See, I think the Amalekite spirit is actually a prototype of that thing which wages war against the church of God in the Northwest. Hide out, be afraid. Don't rock the boat. They're going to cancel you. They're going to kick you off social media. Don't say anything. The church might shrink. You don't want to be controversial. Don't raise your head. You might get picked off. Come on, just be small. Come on, don't pursue those dreams. No, don't be radical for Jesus. Just keep to yourself and the enemy will stay away. But friend, there is too much at stake. The Bible says the Lord looked for one to stand in the gap, but he found no one. So let it be our resolution in this hour that when the Lord's eyes go to and forth throughout the earth, that he finds a bright, bold, brave bride standing up saying, here am I, Lord, send me.
Watch verse four. They camped on the land and they ruined the crops all the way to Gaza. They did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, cattle, or donkey. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Listen, could it be that the destruction our nation has seen over the last 24 months has been with the express purpose of God eliciting a cry from his people? Could this be the redemptive plan of God in the midst of the chaos and death that we have seen? The enemies of God so impoverished the Israelites that they begin to cry out for God to save them. Could this be our moment where we would call on his name and he would hear from heaven and he would forgive our sin and he would heal our land? See, when humanity reaches the end of their rope, they begin to call on an outside existential force. When people realize that their own programs have failed, their best laid plans have come to nothing, their own attempts at salvation and righteousness have collapsed, when people get desperate enough, they begin to call on Jesus. I am seeing a hunger now that I have never seen before. People will not sit idly by while the enemy destroys another generation. There is a cry rising up in the hearts of the righteous. God send your fire, vindicate your people, and pour out your spirit. <laughs> then the angel of the Lord came down and sat under the oak tree that belonged to Joash, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I love this. Gideon is hiding in a wine press, terrified of the enemy, operating in fear, just trying to survive long enough to cook another meal. And the angel of the Lord shows up and says, mighty warrior, the Lord is with you. There ain't nothing mighty about Gideon in this moment. But God sees something on the interior of a man that man can't even see himself. God sees the potential for greatness. God sees the possibility for victory. God sees the capacity for leadership. And if God sees it, it's just a matter of time before he will release it. And friend, this is your moment to come out of the shadows and be everything that God knows you to be. If you've been hiding in the wine press, I am calling you out today. If you have been hiding in the caves, I am putting a demand on your life today. You haven't felt mighty, but you are mighty. You haven't felt righteous, but you are righteous. You haven't felt like God is near, but friend, he is with you. And there isn't one battle he has ever lost and he will not start now. For even when your heart condemns you, it is Christ who is greater than your heart. The nation had backslid. The nation was in trouble. The nation was destitute and broken. And so God raised up an individual in order to turn back an entire people. Hear me, God doesn't need the popular vote in order to rescue his people. He needs a man or a woman who will simply agree with what he sees as heaven's reality. Yes, one person with God is still the only majority that all of heaven needs to pour out a blessing that we cannot contain. And in verse 13, watch the response of, of Gideon. Pardon me, Lord, but if the Lord is really with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his miracles that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? If I could rewrite that verse for our context, it would sound like this. Excuse me, God, 
But if you're really with me, then why my family a mess? Excuse me, God. But if you are really with me, then why is my body sick? Excuse me, God, but if you are really with me, then, 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 then why is my marriage in a tough season? And let me tell you why. You have no idea or context for the greatness that you carry. And the enemy is working overtime to cause you to forget that you serve a God who raises up the lowly, who exalts the humble, and will save an entire nation on behalf of the righteous. I love the authenticity of Gideon. Because if I were to be 100% honest with you this morning, I have asked God the same thing. Where are the miracles my grandparents told me about? Where is the outpouring the history books have talked about? Where are the signs and the wonders and the salvations that I have contended for? Because if the Lord is truly with us, then God, where is the proof? Your questions don't scare God. They don't offend God. They invite God into the rawness of the human experience and a God who is invited close to your pain, brokenness, and hurt is a God who will show himself strong in the restoration of all things. I am here to declare to you today, the Lord hasn't abandoned you. He has been preparing you in the wine press because the best development always happens in the dark. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan, it's the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down the Midianites, leaving none of them alive. Excuse me, Lord, I gave you all the reasons why you couldn't work. Now let me give you all the reasons why I can't work. And I love the response of God. He doesn't shame Gideon for his insecurity. He draws near to Gideon in the midst of his questioning and says, I will be with you. I will strike down the Midianites and I will prove once again that I am faithful to finish what I have started. I love the response of God. He don't give him a plan. He don't lay it out in grand fashion. He doesn't give him a time or a date. His response to the spiraling, anxious-filled questioning in Gideon's heart is simply this. I will be with you, and that's enough. And until your spirit is satisfied by the nearness of God, you can have all the armies in the world and all the money in the market and all the popularity on every platform and you will still operate in a demonically inspired insecurity that will keep you hiding out in the shadows when God has called you to the stage. Until it's enough that the Lord is with you, nothing else will ever be. I'm with you, Gideon. But God, my family is all messed up. I'm from the weakest clan. I am the last person that anybody would ever choose. I'm hiding out, trying to run from you. I am scared to death of what my future may hold. But Gideon, I am with you. But God, where are the miracles? I've been waiting on that dream. I've been waiting on that prayer to be answered. I've been waiting on that healing to occur. I heard about it, but I haven't seen it. God, where are you at? Gideon, I am with you. But God, what if it doesn't work? And what if nobody shows up in Seattle? And what if we can't pay for the building? And what if we face resistance? And what if they try to cancel us? And what if they try to persecute us? Russell, I am with you. Pursuit, I am with you. Church of Jesus Christ, I am with you. And when I am with you, the mountains still melt like wax. Now watch, sit down for a minute, watch. I'm going to end here. Watch, I love this. I love this. Then the Lord said to him, peace be with you. Do not fear. 
you shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and he called it, the Lord is my shalom or the Lord is my peace. And to this day, that altar still stands. Hear me pursuit, peace is your portion. Do not fear, you shall not die, for God has heard your prayers and help is on the way. So Gideon built an altar and he called it, the Lord is peace. Listen friend, we haven't built a church. We haven't built a brand. We haven't built a following. We've built an altar. And at this altar, people from every tribe, tongue, and nation gather to encounter his presence. It's far from perfect. It is filled with the messiness of life. But friend, we are building an altar that in a hundred years, historians will write and say, to this day, that altar still speaks. To this day, that sacrifice still speaks. To this day, that sound still echoes. To this day, that region still reverberates. To this day, there is still evidence of a time when God's people returned to him in humility and he responded with a peace that passed our understanding, a peace that defeated our enemies, and a peace that saved our nation. Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. And to that God be all glory and honor in the church, both now and forever. Two weeks ago, I was coming home from a long day at the office and I wasn't feeling too great, but I figured it was just the smoke. It is just the allergies, it's just the season. And I got home and I walked into my house and as soon as I crossed the threshold of my house, the worst migraine I've had in 36 years came on me like a blanket. I found myself laid out in my room in tears, asking God to come meet me in that place, provide healing for my life. I thought I'd have to go into urgent care. It was some of the worst pain I've ever been in. And I'm calling out to God because I still believe in a Jesus who heals. And I heard in my spirit so clear, Russell, rebuke the spirit of death. And I thought to myself, God, it's just a headache. What do you know that I don't? And I heard the Lord say this, you're not just experiencing a, a normal headache at, at the end of a normal day. The church is coming up against principalities and powers in the region that have wreaked death and destruction on the people of God for an entire generation. You are feeling what they are feeling. Rebuke the spirit of death. And so with the only words that I could muster, I said, I rebuke you spirit of death in the name of Jesus. And I heard the Lord say to me, Russell, you will not die. I am with you. The Lord is your peace and I will give you the victory. Some of you have been feeling demonic resistance and you haven't had the language for it. I'm feeling harassed. I'm feeling under a spirit of heaviness and oppression. I'm feeling like every time I take one step forward, I'm taking two steps back. God, what's going on in my life? Am I crazy? Are you crazy? Is the region crazy? Yes, the region is crazy. And the temptation in this moment would for us to cower in the wine press and wait until the enemy has had his way in our generation. But has not the enemy already stolen enough? 
Has not the enemy already caused enough death amongst young men and young women? Has not the enemy already unleashed hell on your marriage and your business? And I'm saying it is this far, but it is no further. I serve a God who still responds with fire. One who is a man of war, who fights on behalf of his people. And I am here to prophetically encourage you this morning. It is time for Gideon's army to arise because greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. Come on, would you stand as we close? Let me pray for you. Father, now in the mighty name of Jesus, we receive the shalom of God that passes our capacity for human understanding. And today we trust in the divine plan of a God who still holds nations and regions in his hand. I stand against that Amalekite oppression that has tried to get you wrapped up in anxiety and fear, that has tried to launch sickness and infirmity on your body, that has tried to convince you that you'd be safer if you just hid out in the dark. And I declare over you today that the light of Christ has come. You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus and the Lord will give you this victory. God, today we offer ourselves unto you. And like Gideon, we respond aware of all of our own disqualifications. But like Isaiah, we say, here am I, send me. And we'll return all the praise which is due unto your name. To the God who was, to the God who is, and to the God who forevermore shall be. We give you all praise and glory. Come on, in Jesus' name, all God's people said amen. And amen. Friend, if you're here today.